Okay, now we move to our second great keynote speaker, Dr. Turchard. Dr. James Turchard, President and CEO and co-founder of the National Instruments. Dr. Turchard named an innovation agent by Fast Company. He co-founded National Instruments in 1976 and transformed a three-team company, three-person team company, into the top 25th company of the U.S. today. A leader in engineering, in science, an innovator, a technologist. He was elected to the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences and Sciences and Engineering, and also National Academy of Engineering. I know how hard it is to get into NAE. Led the engineers and scientists to solve challenging problems of science and technology. And just recently, he became IEEE Fellow. Congratulations, congratulations, Dr. T. I'm proud to invite you to come and give your talk. Okay. All right. First off, I'd like to welcome you to Austin, Texas. Austin has been my home for the last 54 years. I always say I started a company so I could stay here in Austin. Of course, we've grown a lot in high tech over the years, and perhaps now it would be a little bit easier for me to stay, but that was uh, basically why I started a company. Um, it's really, I'm really proud to be here in front of this very august group. Uh, you know, you guys uh, got a big job. Uh, your universities, your companies, and in some cases, even your countries depend on the outcome of the work you're doing in creating the next generation of wireless technology. So it's really uh, good to be here to speak to you about some tools uh, that we're working on for prototyping the algorithms that you're working on. Many, many different things are being tried. Uh, perhaps we can even have some prototyping going on to see if that virtualization is really going to work for security so we can virtualize our attackers and give them tools to do that. So you might know National Instruments uh, as a test and measurement company, and we do a great deal of that, and we're working a lot in 5G and 4G and other technologies in the wireless space, uh, supporting a wide range of uh, test all the way from the design phase on through very high volume production tests, things like uh, power amplifier testing and next generation with uh, uh, testing of uh, those amplifiers. So we have FPGA based capabilities that's given us really the ability to do high speed, high performance testing as well. So uh, today though, I'm going to talk about our role in prototyping. We're working with quite a number of you now, and many of the demos and talks are here at the, this uh, conference, uh, and I'll uh, mention a few of those in my talk. But I'm going to talk about uh, uh, how things have changed. First off, one uh, a slide that really makes, uh, makes this point is here we see the papal conclave in 2005, and how much it had changed uh, in a mere eight years, where everybody was taking the picture, uh, all their closest friends and neighbors needed to have a first glimpse of that picture, so the demand for bandwidth just went through the roof, and will continue to. I even started taking pictures and um, sending them around too, so we're all getting into that. I used to use old-fashioned cameras for just very recently, because the Smartphone ones weren't quite as good, but finally they're really, really good and good because the volume is so high. Once again, the volume drives the quality as it has done in the whole mobile space. So 
there's a tremendous need for the next generation of technology already. And we know we're just rolling out LTE in these things. So we got a lot of work to do. And so what I'm going to talk about is how prototyping can be speeded up tremendously so we can try out a lot of ideas. To set the frame for that, I, use, I like to use uh, Dr. Fettweiss's slide here that talks about the demand for more communication speed. We want to do machine to machine and all kinds of things that require real time uh, responses. So we want lower latency in the process. And then we want the batteries to last forever. So, you know, tremendous conflicting demands that we have on the whole uh, system. So a lot of research has to uh, be done to get to the bottom line on this. Uh, another big area we hear a lot about is the Internet of Things, and uh, National Instruments is involved more in industrial space, so we're looking at things. How is industry going to be impacted, and how can we play a role? So about eight years ago, at the, worst, uh, at the first uh, uh, National Science Foundation Cyber Physical Systems Conference, I gave a talk describing uh, our system, our compact real system, which was do it using multi-core uh, processing and FPGAs, would be playing in this industrial space. So we've been working at it a well. while. Uh, we see a tremendous opportunity, a revolution in how industry works. And the key point on, on this slide I'd like to make is that all aspects of what's happening in a general uh, public affects how manufacturers work. They use uh, Facebook. They use all the tools they can possibly get uh, to help improve efficiency, make life a little easier. You can check to see how the production machine is working from the beach, for example. So you're really integrating many, many different things. And we use the phrase big analog data to talk about our data. And of course, scientists and engineers with their high-speed A to D converters can generate tremendous amount of uh, uh, data. For example, the CERN project, they really literally have robots managing the recording devices so they can very, very rapidly change them because they need to keep the data on banking archive style uh, records so that they can use them for the next many years as they look back and see what happened at each uh, event. So uh, big analog data is going to play a big role in our lives and the lives of industries as well. Uh, the key uh, thing I want to talk about today is the role of a platform in how we operate and how we can very quickly bring our ideas to real life, to life. And so, in other words, accelerate tremendously the speed at which we can innovate and try out new things. So to start that discussion, I'm going to ask for raise their hands. How many of you are wearing a traditional watch? Now, mine's broken, so I don't have it, but I'm going to get it back. I still love it. Uh, and how, how many of you have the alternative, the smartphone that uh, you're using two, and they often look to see what time is. Well, as you can see, life has moved on, but we're still clinging to some of the past. Uh, but you now have your virtual watch uh, on your phone. And here are other examples of instruments or measurement devices that we've had in the past and used, televisions, um, music players, and so forth, that now are being virtualized. We have virtual instruments that we're using to measure temperature, level, and uh, so forth. And then we have platform-based embedded uh, systems. Now, please notice, these can all be built on the same platform. You don't need a different platform to build instruments that you build embedded systems. So that's kind of the key to National Instruments strategy is to create one platform that can be used by hundreds of thousands of different people. So we can invest tremendously 
in our efforts to get the performance and capability where we want it. And I'll uh, share another example uh, that has done this very, very well, and uh, that's the iOS platform. And I like to highlight a specific example of a device, and that's a bagpipe tuner. You know, I don't think any of us thought that you tune a bagpipe. I was watching a bunch of bagpipers getting set up to tune at a central market here in Austin, and the guy was walking around seeing, it, and they were twiddling with their pipes, and they were tuning the bagpipes. So I was curious. I went on uh, App Store to see, was there an app that tunes bagpipes? Yes, there's an app. So the poor guy making bagpipe tuners is in big trouble, right? As it, uh, many, many other vendors use these virtual in, uh, devices uh, built around a platform, how now has displaced. Well, that's kind of the theory of a platform. It gets so good, whether it's the camera that's now good enough for me to use even, uh, even though I love good pictures, uh, that, uh, um, in fact, I got one that was actually better than my little pocket camera was out at my uh, brother's vineyard. Uh, so basically, a platform-based approach can really, really transcend many, many different applications. And can be, the software can support uh, many different devices, size of screen and so forth, all part of what you're trying to do. So that's the properties of a platform. So uh, as you can see, this uh, iOS platform now supports like a million apps and growing all the time. Almost anything you can imagine, you can find an app for it. And that's because it's a platform that everybody shares, everybody can develop on, and everybody can use. So uh, looking at some of the theory, and over the last uh, decade or so, we've been looking and closely at the properties of platforms and how to make them work. And one of the uh, researchers that we work closely with and has a very good vision, and he has been involved uh, in uh, development of design companies, or EDA companies, San Giovanni Vincentelli, uses this hourglass, as I just showed with the iOS, to describe this, where you have the application space at the top, you're exploring many, many different possibilities of what you can do. Then you have the API platform or software that integrates across a choice of hardware on into the archi hardware architectural space. And this concept really helps us understand the properties and what we need to do to be successful as a platform-based company. So at National Instruments, we're serving both this test and measurement space spanning all the way from DC to uh, tens of gigahertz bandwidth and up uh, to make measurements. But we're turning right around and using the same platform to develop embedded systems. And we got tens of thousands of installations now in the industrial space in this uh, new internet of things or cyber physical systems as we like to call them. A uh, space that we're doing with a combination of multi-core processing, distributed multi-core, and FPGAs, all in one development environment, uh, using our LabVIEW technology, serving different hardware platforms, from very rugged ones, more rugged than traditional PLCs, to uh, our PXI systems that work both on the factory floor and in the production test area as well, and then our measurement uh, devices for data acquisition instrument control. So uh, another key property of a platform is that your applications migrate across generations of hardware. With Moore's Law still active, that's a very important point. If you look at our compact Rio platform, which is a combination of a multi-core processing, and an FPGA, we've migrated, starting with uh, uh, PC processors and Spartan 2s, and uh, moving to PowerPCs, Spartan 3s, onto Spartan 6s, 
And then now onto the ARM with the zinc processor from Xilinx to an Arctic 7. So with our customers being able to move their apps without having to change the link, we're taking care of many, many details as the uh, FPGAs change, as the processor change, as the development tools change. Now, I've visited many facil physics facilities that have uh, Vertex 2 uh, FPGAs and have no idea how to move their application to the latest uh, Vertex 7s. Uh, with the uh, platform-based approach, that infrastructure work is done to solve that problem. And that's a great efficiency improvement for development as well as simply the tools themselves to speed up that development. And so for us, it's about a specialized data flow programming approach we call LabVIEW and, and it's structured data flow. It's a full Turing complete programming language which deals with distribution of software very, very nicely. Perhaps we can work on this virtual hacking problem with it. So it's about system design, um, a platform that lets us design at the system level, yet dive down as deep as we need to, to do whatever we need for uh, efficiency, speed, and so forth. The other key element that we are bringing to a party is intense integration of time into uh, the platform, starting with high-speed backplane timing uh, that's at the nanosecond level and such, and then looking at global clock synchronization. And we're working very actively with the TSN work that's going on now for next generation global clocking across systems, because then we can distribute the computation in a synchronized way and uh, uh, create a lot of capability. Then we combine that with the software capability in the FPGAs where we directly program the FPGA with the data flow programming. We add time loop so we can synchronize things, coordinate cores, coordinate FPGA programming on, and then uh, software constructs like FIFOs and and queues, and then the structured data flow that lets us organize the computation across multiple computing elements. So that brings us to our topic of communication research, where we're finding this technology to give it a lot of differentiation in programming and prototyping systems. Uh, some of the key carabouts are massive MIMO, uh, the networks and setting up and scheduling networks, uh, 5G waveforms, and millimeter wave research, all going uh, into thoughts about what can we do for 5G. So prototyping is a key part of algorithm research. And to uh, make that uh, go further, we'd like to design something and immediately turn around and prototype it and then be able to deploy it. Uh, I use the term algorithm engineering to uh, talk about the combination of uh, mathematical algorithm development with the demonstration in real time of that algorithm. So I term, use the term algorithm to describe that. So classical design flow is about doing some mathematics, so clever, figuring out a clever idea, then getting you a bunch of VHDL or C programmers to uh, demonstrate that in real life so they can see that it really works once you take into account noise and re uh, whatever, reflections and so forth, and then finally into system in, in, uh, in the implementation. So a great deal of time and effort goes into those steps. What you would really like is a design flow where your programming environment immediately mapped onto your hardware as you do in the platform and then onto the demonstration in real time of your system at each level that you want to try it out with. And that's what we've been working to do. And we've been able to successfully demonstrate uh, reducing the time of demonstrating an algorithm by a factor of three or more. So 
Uh, now, at this conference, I'm proud to announce a new product that's taken us even further on this quest to, to find a technology that will uh, make it possible for us to really deliver on the promise. We've made great progress. You see some, you can see nice demonstration, but there's more to do. In our new LabVIEW communications design suite is designed to take us to the next level. Now, uh, this combines the hardware prototyping capability with software. Traditionally, we've had this structured data flow, which we introduced in 1986, and we've uh, spent the last almost 30 years refining, uh, learning how you make data flow fast and programming on FPGAs and all this. And we've done a lot to solve some of the very tough data flow problems like, like um, uh, uh, copying arrays and so forth. Uh, at the same time, in 1986, Professor Lee at Berkeley, under Dr. Uh, Messerschmitt, was getting his PhD on data flow. And it was synchronous data flow, which is loved as a model by communications designers. And the difference is that synchronous data flow deals with some of the uh, deals of putting the right uh, size FIFOs and so forth, the scheduling of multi-rate and so forth. So I'm happy to announce we're bringing those two technologies together in one platform so you get the best of both worlds. We have the full Turing complete data flow programming environments integrated with the synchronous data flow paradigm so that we can offer you the best technology with high-level synthesis on the hood to create a very, very fast prototyping environment. Now, this is version 1.0, and we always know there's a little bit more to do well, to get to 2.0, as our developers will tell you, but it's a good start. And it's really something I've been looking forward to a long time, for at least the last 15 years, to bring these things together and make a development environment to, for prototyping that really achieves the productivity. So, some examples of what we are already doing. It's millimeter wave prototyping. You can see demonstrations here with Nokia. Here's a, another description of it using a, getting a, over a one gigahertz bandwidth in the system uh, to show that this can be implemented and so forth. Another example is uh, work with New York Poly uh, to do channel sounding and characterization using the same platform, for example. Another example is work with TU Dresden on a variety of projects with a 5G lab and test bed. Uh, here we see uh, uh, cleaning up dirty RF is one application. A second one is uh, GFDM. I, I look at it as creating better filters. Uh, for your uh, waveforms, and this is a nice demonstration that really shows the benefits of doing this as well. Uh, here we see uh, Lun working with a 100 by 100 MIMO system, again using this prototyping platform uh, to quickly, in a fraction of the time, build this system. Uh, so the basic here, here you see the hardware with the massive MIMO done from in six months start. Uh, start to prototype. So uh, here, uh, again, this is the block diagram showing a combination of PXI and the uh, uh, USRP hardware to create the system to get the high-performance FPGA processing. Here we see digital pre-distortion prototype system, again, working with the FPGA to do the DS DPD algorithms. And uh, wireless communication research for looking at cognitive radio and white space detection. Uh, a professor from Portugal in the EU project. Uh, again, another application to quickly prototype. And wireless communication for angle of arrival detection with uh, uh, 12 uh, of the USRP devices in an anechoic chamber. Again, demonstrating quickly with a prototype the technology with our LabVIEW software. And uh, um, uh, uh, coding uh, approach to get a gigabit per second, uh, up to a few 10 gigabits per second, migration to higher care frequency research as well, 
using our, in this case, LabVIEW comms uh, technology. Uh, and just to show that it's not only communications that this technology can be done, we've been building radars with it as well. Uh, there's a passive radar that Celex does that shows uh, uh, how you can use digital broadcasting, television broadcasting signals to tell where airplanes are in the sky, a pretty neat application. Also in Japan, they're measuring the size of raindrops in these flash floods. Uh, to see whether there's going to be a serious flooding problem in a certain location in the, in the mountains. Again, uh, radar is being built with the same platform as we're building, doing communication work, as we're doing testing uh, in all, uh, many, many different areas, all the way across for, uh, with embedded applications as well. For smart grid, we have a smart grid analyzer all built with FPJ technology, uh, machine condition monitoring, all the way up to these communication research, all built around the strategy and the philosophy of a platform where the intensity can be great on creating the underlying uh, infrastructures. And one of my favorite descriptions is we have a wire in LabVIEW that we spend 160 man years developing. You can't afford that on an individual project. But if you're developing a platform, you're going to get those underlying features right. And that's what makes the platform work. So with that, I'd like to summarize by saying we're doing a lot of different 5G prototyping with our customers. We see Moore's Law still alive in the well to give us some more capability in our next generation smart mobile devices. And we see that a platform can really help in the development of 5G systems. So with that, I'd like to thank you. Questions, comments, please? OK, let's thank our speaker. Thank you very much. All right. Dr. T, Dr. T, on behalf of uh, Globecom 2014, thank you for that wonderful keynote and your wonderful support as a platinum sponsor for uh, Globecom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. Before I give the microphone to Ted again. I just want to invite everybody to come to the tomorrow's keynote session at 8.30. And also, just at 10.30, we have uh, Industry Forum 1, conducted by Pari Bajpay of AT&T. That would be a great place to go. And thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mahmoud. Some important announcements. Some important announcements. Uh, first of all, uh, Dr. T and all the